welcome to Stackelbeck on Terror. Well, if you've been watching this show over the past few weeks and months, you know that one of the main themes I've been hitting is this global push to shut down free speech about Islam. It's going on at the UN, it's going on right here in Washington, D.C. It's a very dangerous thing, and that's why we're very fortunate today to have two warriors for free speech with us. First up is Guy Rogers, Executive Director of ACT for America. And later in the show, we'll have Diana West, author of the great new book, American Betrayal. So today you're going to get the inside scoop about what's really going on in the push to criminalize free speech and take away your First Amendment rights. This is serious stuff, folks. First up, my interview with ACT for America's Guy Rogers. Take a look. Guy, welcome back to Stackelbeck on Terror. Thank you, my friend. Always great to have you here, my oh, friend. Always and, uh, great to be here. Yeah, you know, I, I love having you in town because every time you're in town, Act for America has some great new initiative, Guy. I mean, you guys are true watchmen and watchwomen on the wall. Um, so your latest initiative is one that is very important. It's one we've hit on a bit here on the show. Uh, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. This is a the Islamic body at the UN that's right. basically looking to shut down free speech about Islam. Tell us a bit more about who they are, Guy, and what they're doing at the OIC. The OIC um, is the 56 Muslim states and the Palestinian Authority, and they are the largest international body other than the UN. And uh, they have been working at this effort to, in effect, criminalize any speech that is deemed, in their view, offensive or insulting to Islam. They've been working on this now for about 15 years at the UN. They've gotten resolutions passed in the passed in the past uh, yeah. that were that were they 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 talked about broadening them. You know, we we, we oppose defamation of religion, generally right. speaking. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> That's not what it's about. And there's a UN resolution they're pushing, guy. UN resolution 16. They got it passed. They got it passed. In, the they got it passed in 2011. This was what was different about this one. This was the first time that our government worked with them to get this passed. In all the prior efforts that they had at the UN going back to the late 1990s, our government did not. This time, Secretary, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton went to the OIC, mm. said, can you draft a resolution that will deal with the issue of Islamophobia, denigration of religions, yeah. and yet still protect free speech? This is the Obama administration. What you're telling us, Guy, is basically the American government, the Obama administration, is actually working willingly with this that's, organization. That's correct. That is seeking to shut down. Basically, this show would not happen. That's correct. Uh, if the OIC had its way. Um, how does Benghazi, rewinding a bit to September 2012, Guy, how does Benghazi factor into all of this? Because I look back, and initially the administration blamed the Benghazi massacre on a film about Muhammad. The video, right, Some right. low-budget film on right, YouTube about right. Muhammad. That nobody's seen. That nobody's seen. And that filmmaker is jailed now. Right. Uh, we can't, obviously, we can't get into the administration's heads, but do you think there may have been uh, an ulterior motive there with their whole tack of blaming that film? Well, it's very clear it was. Uh, the, the, they, they ran ads in the Muslim world mm. decrying the film and, say, and so on. I mean, so this, is, this has been the message of the Obama administration from pretty much day one. Mm. Uh, and so what the OIC found was for the first time a willing partner in pushing the agenda of their goal of criminalizing yeah. uh, anything that denigrates Islam. And, and what's interesting is, is that the State Department will say, no, this resolution doesn't do this. Resolution 1618 doesn't do this. The Istanbul process, which is now in, they're having meetings about every six months yeah. to implement this, that doesn't do this. Globally <clears throat> implement yeah, it. to globally implement it. And yet when you read what leaders of the OIC say, uh, there was a Saudi, uh, a Saudi Gazette article back in February, and uh, this leader said, the next session of the Istanbul process on Islamophobia will be held in the first half of this year, and the session will squarely focus on the issue of criminalizing denigration of religions. They're not hiding what they're trying to do. One religion, Islam. That's correct. That's cor because because yeah. here's the thing. If they were serious about criminalizing the denigration of our religions, well, you'd have to do things completely differently in Saudi Arabia and Yemen and Iran and so on because 
they denigrate Christianity and Judaism yeah. all the time. Right. No churches, no synagogues, no Bibles allowed Can't, in Saudi cor Arabia. Correct. The height of hypocrisy, guy. To me, it's a scary thing because, look, guy, what you're telling us, what the OIC is doing is words like a jihad or Islamofascism, Islamist, radical Islam, will be struck from the le lexicon, essentially. And if we try to have an open and honest discussion, and yes, maybe even point to Islam's core texts and how they motivate some of the terror we see, then man, we may end up in jail. That seems like that is the desired end game by these folks. Well, and the fact of the matter is it's already happening in Europe. It's been happening for years. We saw what happened to Gert Wilders. We, yeah. uh, Elizabeth Sabadish Wolf, who is a chapter leader of ours in Vienna, who was convicted on Great a charge of, yeah. of denigrating religion. Mm -hmm. uh, so all they're doing now is they're trying to take it beyond Europe and take it to the rest of the West. Yeah. And of course, America being a key target. And they have a willing partner, apparently, in the Obama administration. Uh, one other thing that chilled me about it, Guy, was back in September after Benghazi at the UN, President Obama said, and I quote, the future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. That's from a US commander in chief, that is stunning. But Act for America, thankfully, is doing something about this guy, about this UN Resolution 1618, Tell us about the petition you have started against it and where we can find it. We started a, a campaign called Americans United to, De to Defend Free Speech. And on our website, actforamerica.org, it's an open letter that we're going to send to all 50 state legislatures and the, the U.S. Congress. We're hoping to really get a major push on this this fall going into next year's legislative sessions. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it calls on legislatures to pass a resolution opposing the implementation of U.N. Resolution 1618. Now, it doesn't have the force of law. It's symbolic, but the point of fact is a symbolic resolution like that passed in a number of states would send a very clear message up from the grassroots sure. up sure. to the federal government, we're just not going to sit here and watch our First Amendment rights be rolled. Yeah. I mean, we're not going to see them stripped away, yeah. chipped away step by step yeah. uh, by, this, by this UN pr yeah. uh, uh, process. I encourage everyone to go to the Act for America website, uh, sign up. You mentioned the fall, looms large, yes. September 25th right. guy. Tell us what ACT is doing on that day. September 25th is the 224th anniversary of the congressional passage of the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. uh, we have dubbed that Freedom of Speech Day. And if you go to our website, we have that those sliding features at the top, as many websites do. That's where they can find the open letter. They can also find information about Freedom of Speech Day, where they can sign up to host an event. There's basic information on there. Uh, everybody who does, we're going to provide them some videos, some materials, some instructions on how to do this. We did something like this in 2011 called Open the Koran Day. I remember and we had well. about 325 mm -hmm. sites around the world. Uh, not just in America, that did this. And we right now have about 225 people that have signed up to host Freedom of Speech Day events. And I'd like to see that double by the time we get to September to, to is, get the word yeah. out and just let people know. The First Amendment is under attack in this country. Yeah. And I, there's something I run into, and it really, really, really disturbs me. And that is the sense that because it's in the Constitution, we don't need to worry about protecting it. Mm -hmm. Well. There's a lot of things that are happening in America today that people wouldn't have believed possible 30 years ago. That's right. What did Reagan say? Freedom must, we can never, basically paraphrasing Ronald Reagan, we can't rest on our laurels. Freedom Correct. must be fought for, defended at every turn. We can never get too complacent. Guy, as you say, I think, unfortunately, in this country, we are getting too complacent. Uh, talk about the media, a great example. The media and the, basically the censorship guy on talk of the Islamist motivations of the Boston bombers, uh, the London murderers that we saw back in May, right, a, right. a British soldier beheaded in the street. Right. Uh, talk about how the media pretty much whitewashed, in many cases, the Islamic angle there. It's the most egregious example of this was the Fort Hood situation. Yes. Remember back in 2009. I mean, here was a man. Uh, yeah, here was a man who was clear about his motives. Yeah. There was plenty of information on him. He'd been talking about jihad for yeah. three years, uh, and yet for days, you know, the media was playing the, you know, well, one one of the one of the absurd things was he had not post-traumatic stress disorder because he hadn't been deployed yet, yeah. but pre-traumatic stress disorder, which, you know, how ridiculous is that? Yeah. Um, and of course, the Pentagon report that came out yeah. and basically called it you know, workplace violence. Uh, this, this aids and abets the OIC. It aids and abets those who are trying to tamp down on this discussion. Uh, d did you hear what happened in ten Tennessee recently, Manchester, Tennessee, yes. where a U.S. attorney and an FBI agent, at the request of a Muslim group, 
came to talk about how there's things we, we really are going to warn you about what you're saying that might yeah. violate the civil rights of Muslims. Right. You know, freedom of speech is a very important right we have in this country. And we're the only country that enjoys it at the level that we do because of our, because of our First Amendment. And to see this chipped away like this, not just by those who are our enemies, but by those who are supposedly protecting us, which is people on the Depart Department of Justice in the State Department, this should absolutely shock people to mm -hmm. taking some kind of action. They don't need to get out on the ramparts, you know, doing like yeah. we do full time every day, but if they sign that open letter, if, they, if they're more yeah. willing to do something like Freedom of Speech Day, absolutely get involved yeah. and help us raise the awareness level. Because I think with all the other things that are going on, mm -hmm. you know, politically today and all the scandals, sure. people I think are gonna be more sensitive to this now and, and more concerned about it than they might have been, say, a year ago or two years ago. Guy, I agree, and I couldn't agree with you more. You're doing great work. Uh, everyone, September 25th, Freedom of Speech Day, number one. Remember that date, mark it off. The ACT website, Guy, give us a website where we can go also and sign the petition as Act, well. ActForAmerica.org. ActForAmerica.org. Uh, Guy, thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate you coming by. Thanks, Eric. Always great to have you here. Coming up, much more. Another free speech warrior, Diana West, talking about her new book, Don't Move. Welcome back. I'm joined now by author Diana West, author of a great new book called American Betrayal, The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character. It is a must read. It's an epic, Diana. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Eric. Uh, and wow, it's a history lesson. It's a cautionary tale. And you draw a great parallel to today, which we'll get into. But I want to take it back on the historical note at first, Diana. Right now in this country, I believe we're seeing a march towards socialism in many ways under the Obama administration. Arguably, it started even earlier, but in your book, you say started 75 years ago. Right. Explain that a little bit. Well, this is the history of what we know in that very folksy term, the New Deal, which oh. came in under FDR. President Roosevelt regularly regarded as one of our greatest presidents. Mm -hmm. Um, what the New Deal did and what Roosevelt did also at the very same time was recognize the Soviet Union, November 16, 1933. This recognition, I believe, set us off on a course toward moral relativism, cultural relativism, all of the ills that we think of as cultural and religious ills, they are also historical ills and we, we need to see them together. In so doing, we saw this um, institutionalization of double standards. The Soviet Union never kept its word on anything, including, including the agreement. The agreement that was signed was actually a set of promises by the Soviet Union promising to refrain from trying to overthrow the United States, support secret agents in the United States, and so on. And FDR, that was going and, on. FDR and Stalin met several times, obviously, yes. during World War II. Actually, had a pretty good relationship, right? Much too good. Roosevelt yeah. had a very worshipful attitude towards Stalin. And this is, I think, what is the most controversial point in the book. This penetration that took us on the road to socialism, communization, this penetration by hundreds, we now know hundreds of American traders were in our government by World War II. So what I am arguing is that the good war that we all look back to with such pride in our leadership was actually an extension of Soviet policy to install the Soviet empire in Europe. And you outlined specific yes. cases in this book, Diana, about Soviet spies in right. the upper reaches of the American yes. government. It is shocking. And I think a lot of this has been exposed in this book. We haven't heard much about this. Right. I think this is such an expose about the extent. They were all pervasive, weren't they, in the upper reaches yeah. of our government? Well, the interesting thing for me, I'm not a historian, I'm a journalist. The interesting you could have thing, fooled me, though. This is, this is a history <laughs> there are a lot lesson. Of footnotes, footnotes. And for history buffs, I know a lot of people watch this show are history buffs. Right. This is a primer on how we got where we are. To the disastrous state of affairs today, this is how we get there. Diana outlines it. Well, what, the thing that I came across that shocked me in doing the research was that the intelligence history, which really became um, codified and um, signed, sealed, and delivered after the fall, of the, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and we saw the intelligence archives in Moscow opening, showing what was really going on, the secret cables, followed by openings in Washington, the very famous Venona archive mm -hmm. came to us in the mid-1990s. This confirmed the presence of 
about 500 known agents. There were more, but in terms of named agents, we now have about 500. That history was never integrated into our general understanding. So in other words, the intelligence historians have been plowing these archives and doing their work and giving us this information. However, our general historians have not knit the stories together. Diana, we have to leave it right there. Much more coming up with Diana West, author of American Betrayal. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We're talking to Diana West, author of the new blockbuster, American Betrayal, The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character. Diana, this started under FDR, but it yes. progressed under uh, administrations that followed him as yes. well, right? Truman, even Eisenhower. Yes. Talk about that a little bit. Well, this was, again, the, another phase of betrayal by our leaders. Again, it is not an indictment in any way of our brave people, our military sure. men, and so on. It, this is the leadership, the corrupt leadership. At a certain point, the infiltration became known to people in the government at high levels. And what I found, beginning with Truman, who followed Roosevelt, and Eisenhower, who followed Truman, was their first impulse was to cover it up again, was not to, for the good of the country, expose this, but rather to put it back in a box. We can look back, uh, it's very easy for many to remember what happened with Whitaker Chambers, mm -hmm. the very same famous ex-Soviet sure. in intelligence sure. agent who exposed the very famous Soviet spy, Alger Hiss. It was known, it was proven that Alger Hiss was involved, was yeah. deeply involved in, in being a traitor and for the Soviet Union guy in FDR's at the State Department. He basically set up yeah. the United Nations and he was very instrumental at Yalta of doing mm -hmm. all kinds of terrible things. Mm -hmm. The impulse of, Rose of Truman at this point was not to thank Chambers and to give him a Medal of, of Honor, a Medal of Freedom. No, it was to perhaps sick the government and decide if he uh, could be sued for perjury, if he could be, uh, you know, smeared as having been in a, a mental asylum, which was a Soviet lie against him. This yeah. was the impulse to put it away. Covered it was partisan. Up. It was uh, yeah. not good for the country. And indeed, it set up the terrible division that the country had. Wow. in the decade to follow that yeah. we know as the McCarthy period. Right, right. I was going to ask you about that. Um, this obviously started under FDR. It, it progressed. How did it come up to the point where we are today? How did this really lay the groundwork yeah. to today where we're slouching towards socialism in this country? Yeah. And, well, and McCarthy, by the way. Yeah. Before we get that, Diana, yeah. tell me a little bit about your, your take on Joseph McCarthy. You have a different take than most of what we hear in the mainstream sure. media, obviously, about this man. Of course. Tell us a bit more of your thoughts on him. He's the most maligned man in American history. And what did he do? He tried to expose the infiltration and penetration by what we now know were hundreds of American mm -hmm. traitors. He deserves recognition for that. He deserves to be honored as a great patriot. So yes, I have a very different opinion of McCarthy has become mm -hmm. a buzzword, a way of stopping oh, debate. Yeah. McCarthy is, yeah, right. I mean, it's, it's the same as red baiting. Before McCarthy, yeah. the word was red baiting. That stopped debate. Mm -hmm. Today, the word is Islamophobia. Yeah. These are terms that are designed to put the person on the offensive, mm -hmm. to stop the discussion of facts, and to sort of fritz everyone's mental circuits. Yeah, I mean, there's no worse right. slur in American you know, right. political lexicon than calling someone McCarthyite. Right. I mean, but you, it, it, to me, it's fascinating. I think people are going to find that fascinating about the book. There's a lot you don't know about Joseph McCarthy. He's been demonized. Right. But in the book, you give a whole different uh, view, which I found fascinating. Yes. And plus, there were other great investigators. This is something we're missing today. You know, listen up, Congress. We yeah. had many investigators from both parties. We had Martin Dyes in the House, who opened up the House Un-American Activities Committee in yeah. 1938, looking at communism, looking at fascism, looking at infiltration from Germany, Italy, those kinds of things. FDR didn't want him to investigate communism. And indeed, it destroyed their relationship. After the war, we have Senator Pat McCarran, you have Joseph McCarthy, you have others trying to investigate what had happened in the 1930s and 40s. And they were all maliciously slandered with Joseph McCarthy, most of all. And it sounds like today, the, as you mentioned, the Islamophobia yeah. label, bringing it up to, to, to uh, today, Diana, the right. Islamophobia label, when people try to expose uh, jihad, Islamism, uh, they're shut down. The wor they're words like down. jihad aren't even Isolated. used in the lexicon. Right. And there are Muslim Brotherhood operatives in this government, it appears, sure. as well. 
Exactly. Talk about that a bit, the parallels between now and the Soviet Union. The parallels are terrifying because, first of all, we don't know our history. We should be able to recognize what's happening today, but our history is really lost history. It has been kept from us by the people who write the narrative, and they always say history is written by the victors. I agree. The victors in America were the communists, the Marxists, the socialists, the leftists. They have given us this history that glorifies this past mendacity. During World War II, not a single anti-communist book was, was published in this country. There was a freeze on that kind of discussion because, of course, we were allies with Joseph Stalin. This attitude carried over to President Roosevelt, who actually told the American people there was freedom of religion under Stalin. It was guaranteed. That's what he told the people. And FDR These is so lionized lies. in right. the American mind. You know? Today we have the same issues happening. We have Islam is a religion of peace. That's what President yes. George Bush told us. Yes. The facts about Islam, again, are being withheld just as the facts of communism were withheld yeah. during these two war periods. We got, we got to take the break, yeah. Diana. C completely mind-blowing how we repeat the mistakes of the past. Wrapping up with Diana West after the break. Don't move. <laughs> Welcome back. We're wrapping up with author Diana West. Uh, Diana, in your book, obviously you shine a light on the, the negative, the bad actors, but there were a lot of truth tellers back then during the Soviet era, and there's truth tellers today about the Islamist threat. Sure. Tell us a bit more about that. Well, this was actually the joy of writing this book, was finding these American heroes whom I had never heard of, and I think most Americans have never heard of, who were there understanding, trying to understand what was happening, trying to bring the truth to the American public, bring the truth to the American leaders, whether it was President Roosevelt or Truman, and, and write straight to the American people, some of the great journalists who also worked, some of the great Senate investigators and House investigators. These are the truth tellers that I believe are really the way back to a fix on reality and a fix on morality as well, because it is in the truth that we can find our way through to solutions. So we have to uncover all the lies and go back and find these men and women who were able to tell us the truth and stick to it. Yeah, and we need it today as right. well. Uh, Diana, great stuff. It, always great to have you. The book is called American Betrayal, The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character. Character. You can find it at Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, wherever books are sold. So thank you, Diana West. And until next week from Stackelbeck, Ontario, God bless. And remember, never hold your peace.